So this is um, what is normally the Simon Don uh, reading group. Um, we're taking a, a detour today. We're going to be reading a text by uh, Jean Cavaillas and Albert Lodman uh, called Mathematical Thought. Um, this is something that I, I translated recently. So we're working on a, the draft translation. Um, we're going to go through this text and, and try to figure out what are the difficult points and interesting points um, for discussion. Um, so uh, yeah, this, this text, uh, just to sort of briefly situate, so this text comes from uh, the presentation that Cavaillas and Lotman did at the um, society, French Society for Philosophy in 1939. Uh, and this was just after each of them had uh, completed their theses. In, in the French system at the time, you had to do two theses uh, to get your degree. Um, and so they had uh, completed their theses and, and published them separately as, as books. So they did, they did this joint presentation because they're, they're similar, well, they, they have uh, similar interests in, in philosophy of mathematics or, or mathematical philosophy. Uh, and, and so they... Um, did this joint presentation, um, and then there's a discussion afterwards with some of the leading French mathematicians of the time who had been on the jury for the for the or the committee for the uh, for their theses, uh, and then also some well-known French philosophers are present as well. Um, so we'll probably get to that next week, uh, the dis discussion portion. I thought this was relevant text for this server in particular because um, Lotman is uh, an important source for Deleuze. A lot of anything that Deleuze writes about mathematics is generally sort of filtered through Lodman. That's uh, an important source for him. And uh, we can talk about that as we go along today about how that sort of gets introduced into Deleuze's work. So I think I think we can proceed sort of the same way as we were doing with Simon Don. We'll read like a page or so at a time and then uh, stop to discuss. We might want to do things a little bit differently in the uh, discussion portion, just because it makes sense to read one sort of uh, intervention at a time in that portion. But yeah, we'll we'll get to that um, later on. Okay, so I'll, I'll read the first page or so, uh, and then we can go around. The mathematical thought, session of the 4th of February, 1939. Two theses of the highest significance have recently been defended before the Faculty of Letters of the University of Paris on the philosophy of mathematics considered at the point of development it has currently reached. The Society of Philosophy considered that it would be valuable to discuss them simultaneously. It thanks their authors for having been kind enough to lend themselves to that initiative. Uh, Mr. Cavaillet starts from the problem of the foundation of mathematics as it is currently posed and partly solved. The crisis of set theory has indeed resulted, after the work around Bertrand Russell and Hilbert, in transforming the epistemological problem into a mathematical problem subject to the usual regulations of technique. Thus are eliminated today two conceptions of mathematics. One, logicism. Mathematics is a part of logic because the effective formalization of mathematics has shown a that in reality it was not purely logical notions or operations that were appealed to, the problem of the meaning of such notions and operations being left aside, but that the considerations used, all homogeneous, belong to combinatorial calculus or other mathematical theories. The meaning of a symbol is its mode of use in a formal system. B, that it is impossible due to a theorem of Gödel's to insert mathematics into a single formal system. Any system containing arithmetic is necessarily unsaturated. That is, it is possible to construct a proposition that is neither provable nor refutable in the system. Two, the hypothetical deductive conception presented with maximum precision by von Neumann's radical formalism. Indeed, one can only characterize a mathematical theory, a system of axioms and arbitrarily posed rules according to this conception as a deductive system by the use of already constituted mathematical theories not previously characterized in this way. Example for the theory of numbers, Jensen's proof of non-contradiction appealing to transfinite recursion. In other words, essential solidarity between the parts of mathematics with the impossibility of a regression providing an absolute beginning. Mr. Cavallas has then led to the following assertions. One, mathematics constitutes a singular becoming. Not only is it impossible to reduce it to anything other than itself, but any definition at a given time is relative to that time, 
that is to say, to the, the history of which it is the culmination. There is no eternal definition. Talking about mathematics can only be redoing it. This becoming seems autonomous. It seems possible to the epistemologist to find under the historical accidents a necessary connection. The notions introduced are required by the solution of a problem, and by virtue of their mere presence among the previous notions, they in turn pose new problems. There really is a becoming. The mathematician is embarked on an adventure that he can only stop arbitrarily and of which every moment gives him a radical novelty. Two, the resolution of a problem has all the characteristics of an experiment, experience, a construction subject to the sanction of a possible failure, but accomplished in accordance with a rule, that is to say reproducible, therefore not an event, and finally taking place in the sensible. Operations and rules only make sense in relation to a, a previous mathematical system. There is no representation actually thought, distinct from the pure lived experience, vécu, that is not a mathematical system to the extent that it is thought, that is to say, regulated organization of the sensible by virtue of the continuity between mathematical gestures starting from the most elementary. Three, the existence of objects is correlative to the actualization of a method and as such, not categorical, but always dependent on the fundamental experience, experience of an effective thought. The illusion of a possibility of exhaustive description or begetting ex nihilo by axioms unmasked by Skolem's paradox is explained by the necessary gap between exposition and authentic thought. The latter or the central intuition of a method to be expressed would require a completed mathematics explicitation of all, this, all the successive requirements. Objects appear as the projections in the representation of the stages of a dialectical development. In each case, there is for them a criterion of evidence conditioned by the method itself. Example, the evidence specific to transfinite induction. They are therefore neither in themselves nor in the world of experience, but the very reality of the act of knowledge. Okay, let's um, stop here. Um, so some of the um, concepts that are presented in this first passage um, are going to be developed further in the actual uh, presentation itself. Um, so we don't necessarily need to uh, go over everything uh, as it first comes up uh, in this passage. Um, but a couple of points, um, and uh, Angus has posted in the chat um, some uh, sort of quick definitions or references for some of these notions that that come up um, in in Cavalles's exposition uh, uh, in in this portion here. Um, so Cavalles starts out with um, a sort of negative portion of his presentation. So it it has to do with with uh, certain theories of philosophy of mathematics that according to Cavalles, are excluded by the development of uh, mathematical logic. Um, so um, the two conceptions that he thinks are excluded uh, are logicism and the hypothetical deductive conception. Uh, so logicism is a, a philosophy of mathematics according to which uh, mathematics is ultimately reducible to logic. Um, so what that means is that uh, the various uh, mathematical concepts should all be definable in terms of logical operations. Uh, so uh, an example of this was the way that Frege, for example, tried to, um, tried to define number in terms of the extension of a concept. So for Frege, the number four uh, refers to the class of all, uh, um, the class of all, concepts that are instantiated by four objects. Um, so like the class that includes the, the set of suits in a deck of cards, um, the, um, the class that includes the directions on a compass or um, any, any other um, group of four objects. Um, and, and so this logical notion of the extension of a concept is the the foundation that Frege wants to reduce the notion of number down to, um, and there are certain technical reasons why that doesn't work uh, the way that Frege wanted it to, um, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but uh, what what Cavalles appeals to here is the fact that 
in the attempt to develop these systems uh, that would reduce um, mathematical concepts to logical ones, what uh, what was discovered is that there were um, you you ended up having to use these concepts. Uh, or operations that are very hard to to regard as uh, logical ones, like the principle of mathematical induction. Um, so the the principle of mathematical induction, um, well, there's a few different um, forms of induction, but the the basic one is that if you can prove that something holds uh, some property holds of zero, uh, and then you can also prove that um, if the property holds of a given number, then it also holds for the next greatest number, the successor of that number. Uh, then with those two things, you've proven that that property holds for all numbers, right? Because you, you prove it applies to zero, and then you prove that if it applies to a, a given number, it applies to the next number. Uh, and then, so that shows that it applies to one, uh, and then you apply it to one again, and it applies to two, et cetera. Um, so this, principle of mathematical induction is essential for uh, uh, various kinds of proofs throughout mathematics. Um, but it's, it's, um, it's hard to describe this as a, a logical notion. It seems to be a specifically mathematical notion rather than a, a logical one. Um, and it's uh, this type of discovery uh, where you have to appeal to uh, notions that are hard to regard as purely logical ones um, that that leads Kavayas to say that um, logicism as a philosophy of mathematics is uh, is not uh, a viable option uh, from the from the perspective of 1939 uh, and then so the the second um, conception the hypothetical deductive one um, so this is um, a, a less sort of ambitious approach towards mathematics. Uh, so it's rather than uh, trying to reduce all of mathematics to uh, logical operations, you instead, um, you accept the idea that there are specifically mathematical concepts. Um, but the idea is that you, um, you start from certain arbitrary axioms. So just through the, the um, the power of uh, free thought or arbitrary thinking, you can posit a certain act as our starting point. Um, and then mathematics, uh, so the axioms are, are in some sense arbitrary, or they're chosen um, just for the sake of convenience or, or something along those lines. And then uh, the consequences, uh, um, this has to do, this is associated with um, the uh, the rule uh, known as formalism in mathematics uh, to do with the idea that um, mathematical deduction uh, should be understood as uh, a, an operation that just consists in working with signs on a page. Uh, so you you have a, um, a set of signs that are given at the beginning, which are your axioms, and then you have a set of rules that say given a sign that looks like this, you're allowed to write another sign that looks like like this other uh, configuration of signs. Um, and mathematics just consists in applying these rules to um, to given axioms, and uh, and so it's it's a, a completely formal operation. It doesn't have to do with any uh, particular content. Uh, and so Hilbert had a, a famous line that. Um, when you're doing geometry, you should be able to replace the the terms point, line, and intersection with um, I think it was uh, a mug of beer and a table or something like that. You should be able to just replace the the terms, the specific mathematical terms, by any other set of terms, and then all the reasoning should still be valid. Uh, and so this is the the formalist conception of of mathematics um, and associated with the formalist conception of mathematics, there was this project to try to um, reduce uh, some of the more advanced or more uh, complicated regions of mathematics to elementary operations, uh, particularly the operations of arithmetic. Um, 
And so the idea was that um, you could show that some of these more complicated or, or more abstract uh, uh, domains in mathematics were, were still grounded in something um, that was in, in intuitively obvious or immediately obvious, like uh, basic uh, arithmetic or something like that. Um, and uh, you would be able to, by, by doing this, by reducing the uh, questionable or um, less certain domains of mathematics to the, the more certain, you would uh, be able to prove the validity or the, um, uh, the um, consistency of the uh, less certain domains. Um, so is there any, uh, uh, I know this uh, first part is, is very compressed and we'll see more as we go along, but um, um, are there any uh, questions that come up uh, just from this first reading that we can uh, discuss now? Um, this idea that uh, one of uh, Kavayas's, I guess, positive assertions is the idea that um, every moment in, I guess, the solution of a mathematical problem involves a radical novelty. Uh -huh. Did I drop off? Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, right after radical novelty. Oh, yeah. Um, I guess I was wondering if, if that meant that uh, the solutions to these problems are just not, are not already contained within the problems. So there's a creative aspect kind of similar to the uh, the way we were talking about the problem and the solution in Simon Dillon. Yeah, it's um, it's uh, a bit tricky because um, so there is this radical novelty uh, in in exactly that sense that you specified. So um, when you set out a mathematical problem, you um, you you can't um, in in most cases or in the case of a, a an important mathematical problem, you can't find the solution just by sort of analyzing the problem. It, it's not already contained in the problem itself. Um, so that's sort of the one side of this uh, uh, dialectic, as, as Cavayes calls it. Um, but then the other side is that once the solution is found, so once you um, introduce the new technique or new concept or whatever, um, whatever is necessary to solve the problem, then you end up with uh, a kind of necessity. Um, so uh, after that concept has, has been introduced, then you, you can sort of retroactively see, oh yes, of course, this was the concept that, need, that you needed to solve this problem. Uh, and uh, so there's a, a, this contingency and this necessity at the same time, like, um, there there's uh both sides are are present at the same time and and so we have to have a a concept of uh this appearance of a of a, a solution to a problem as something that is both contingent and necessary at the same time which is uh hard to sort of um grasp together but but that's what we have to think of when we when we study the history of mathematics do you think the idea that it's there is this contingency to the solution at the at least before the solution is formulated or during its formulation means that it could be it could have been solved a different way and that any of the solutions at that moment would retroactively appear to be necessary? Yeah, this is um a uh, sort of a general um issue within philosophy of science. Um like the um, the the question of whether there are sort of alternate paths of science, um, like could uh, could the 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 crisis in um, early twentieth century physics that ended up being resolved through the the creation of uh, relativity um, could that could that crisis have been resolved in a different way and have a whole different set of concepts? Um, and, and a different kind of physics that would um, be sort of equally valid as the, the current physics. Um, and for, for Cavalier's, um, 
I'm not sure. I don't think he actually addresses that question specifically. Um, but I think this notion of um, a necessity that that sort of appears um, would would suggest that there there probably is not um, uh, there probably is not a possibility for alternate solutions or or to the extent that there are alternate solutions they they would be equivalent in some sense uh, in a, in a specific mathematical sense um, uh, so it's it might be the case that you could have solved a particular mathematical problem in a different way, but then it would also be the case that you could um, you could show that your new solution or alternate solution is equivalent to the other solution in some sense. Um, and this actually happens on a regular basis in, in mathematics, like people will, will give a, a new proof of something that has already been proven. Uh, and um, the, the new proof doesn't actually um, uh, introduce a, a new mathematical theorem or, or a, new, um, a new piece of knowledge to mathematics, but it, it demonstrates uh, it, it can have other properties, like a, a proof might be uh, more intuitive or, or less complicated than an, an earlier one, or um, it might have uh, particular computational properties that might be um, less computationally intensive and, and so better to run on a computer, uh, for example. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, the, the short answer is that um, I think to the extent that this contingency allows for the possibility of alternate proofs, they would all, or alternate um, solutions to a problem, those solutions would have to be equivalent to each other in some sense. Do you think it's accurate to say that it, like, the solution is really contingent um, prior to being resolved and then really necessary uh, after being resolved? So, or is, I don't know, I guess it's hard it seems like maybe it's more like it's the necessity kind of overwhelms the contingency, but maybe not. Yeah, it's, it's, um, this is a, um, I think why he uses the term dialectics here, um, which we see, um, I think in the later discussion of the, like in the presentation itself. Um, but the reason he uses the term dialectics for this um, relationship between necessity and contingency is precisely because it's it's um, it, it's so hard to grasp both at the same time. Um, like we, as soon as you sort of look at the side of contingency, then it, it seems as if you lose sight of necessity. And then, likewise, when you when you look at the side of uh, necessity, the contingency seems to drop away. Um, but I think. Um, I think it's precisely that holding on to both sides, um, despite the the difficulty or the um, the seeming uh, impossibility, even of of holding on to both. Uh, I think it is it's it's that holding on to both sides that um, constitutes the dialectic that he's describing here. Um, so it, it's we have to. Um, Anytime we we sort of find ourselves leaning toward one side or the other, we have to sort of remind ourselves of the other side. And and uh, so if you if you start focusing on the contingency, then you have to remind yourself about the necessity and vice versa. Interesting. Thanks. Um, one other point, maybe that would be worth just on the the topic of translation here, to uh, because this comes up on a regular basis throughout the text is. Um, the the term experience uh, I've chosen to translate it most of the time by experiment, um, but it also means experience. Um, it has the, both meanings in French. So you say like doing an experiment. Uh, you you use the term experience, but then also having an experience or being a person who is experienced in whatever. You also use the same term. Um, so. Um, I think for Cavalles, uh, both uh, both meanings are are sort of present in, in his work or in his presentation here. Um, 
So when he talks about um, a mathematical uh, uh, problem solving or um, mathematical uh, uh, creation as an experiment, um, I think he has in mind the idea of something that um, something that involves uh, a creation or something new and also something that might fail. Um, so an experiment is something that might succeed or, or it might not. Um, and likewise, in mathematics, you, you have to um, try to create something and you might succeed or, or you might not. It might not do what you wanted it to do. Um, uh, and then at the same time, this experiment is an experience. So it's something that you undergo, that you live through. Um, it, uh, and it's something that transforms the, the subject who, who carries out this experiment uh, or who lives through this experience. So it's, it's not something that, um, it's not just a, a sort of abstract um, uh, operation of thought. It's something that the subject undergoes and experiences. Okay, so let's, um, let's go on to the next page or so. Um, maybe we can read the whole, um, summary of, of Lotman's portion of the text, which is about a page. Uh, yeah, it's about a page. Um, so if someone else would like to read. Oh, yeah. What page is it? Uh, it's page two of the PDF. Uh, the existence? Uh, start, starting from Mr. Lotman fully agrees. Uh, Mr. Lotman fully agrees with uh, Mr. Cavalle on the solidarity that unites the nature of mathematical objects with the singular exper experience of its elaboration over time. There is no determination of the true and the false except in the sense of the effective mathematics and the truth is imminent to the rigorous proof. But from this point on, Mr. Lotman uh, take his departure from Mr. Cavalle uh, if it is accepted that the manifestation of an existent uh, in action takes on uh, its full meaning only as a response to a preliminary problem concerning the possibility of this existent. The establishment of effective mathematical relations appears, in fact, to be relationally posterior to the problem of the possibility of such bonds in general. The study of the development of contemporary mathematics shows, moreover, how the results obtained are organized under the unity of certain themes, which the philosopher interprets in terms of possible bond between the notions of an ideal dialectic. The penetration of topological methods into differential geometry responds to the problem of the uh, relationships of the lo local and the global, of the whole and the part. Duality theorem in topology study, uh, the reduction of extrinsic uh, properties of situation to intrinsic properties of structure. The calculus of variations determines the existence of a mathematical being by the ex uh, exceptional properties that allow its uh, selection. Analytic number theory shows the role of the continuous in the study of the discontinuous. Should I go on? Uh, yes, you can read to the end of the summary, the next okay. uh, paragraph. It turns out that affinities of local structure make it possible to bring together different mathematical theories because they each bring a sketch of a different solution to the same dialectical problem. It is thus, for example, that the theory of domains where a system of axiom is realized in mathematical logic and the theory of the representation of abstract groups, both allow one to observe how, in mathematics, the passage uh, from a formal system to its material realizations takes place. We see, in that sense, we can speak of the participation of distinct mathematical theories in a common dialectic that dominates them. The ideas of this dialectic must be conceived as ideas of the possible relations between abstract notions and knowledge of them is not affirmative of any actual situation. As a del delimitation of the field of the possible, dialectics is pu pure problematic draft of schemas uh, whose drawing needs 
to affirm itself to take shape on a particular mathematical matter. On this indeterminacy, indeterminacy of the dialectic by which its uh, essential insufficiency manifests its, uh, itself ensures at the same time its externality in relation to the temporal becoming of the scientific concepts. One can, in conclusion, specify the links between dialectics and mathematics. Mathematics is presented, first of all, as examples of incarnation, domains where the ideal expectation of possible relations is actualized, but they are privileged examples and one whose advent is as it uh, were necessary. Any effort to deepen the knowledge of ideas extends indeed naturally and simply because this effort is a concern with analysis into effective mathematical constructions. Mathematical thought, therefore, has the imminent role of offering the philosopher the constantly repeated spectacle of the genesis of the real from the idea. Thanks. Um, yeah, so here, so Rothman um, has a, a, a different approach to mathematical philosophy than uh, than Kapayes. So there's, um, for him, the his methodology essentially consists in um, looking at given domains of mathematics and um, finding in them these notions, uh, these um, concepts that uh, appear, um, the, the sort of metaphysical concepts like uh, the part and the whole, or um, the intrinsic and extrinsic, uh, and and he finds them in various mathematical theories, uh, and and some of them are um, very distinct mathematical theories that that have no um, obvious mathematical con connection with each other, um, and. From this um, this exercise in identifying <clears throat> identifying these um, metaphysical concepts at work in various mathematical theories, he um, he then passes to uh, a second stage in which you you sort of um, uh, ascend above the specific mathematical theories and you you look at the um, the metaphysical concepts themselves uh, and the relations between them. And so he, he describes, uh, or he, the term he uses uh, for these metaphysical concepts is notions. Um, and then the relations between these notions he describes as ideas. Uh, and he's here uh, following the uh, Plato's uh, theory of ideas. Um, so these ideas would be, um, like the the relationship between the whole and the part uh, is an idea, or the relationship between the continuous and the discontinuous, uh, and in uh, so these ideas have this dialectic, this um, relationship between these contrary concepts um, that that makes them up, uh, and uh, but this dialectic. Uh, so this dialectic is is pre-mathematical or supra-mathematical. It's something that is not itself mathematical, but it's uh, it's uh, uh, is only it's only ever realized in mathematical theories, in concrete mathematical theories. So um, if you if you just start from the the notions of the whole and the part, you can't um, you can never sort of resolve the the problem of how the whole and the part are related to each other in, in purely um, metaphysical terms. What you do, uh, the only way to come to a, a, a concrete um, solution to this problem is to, uh, is to uh, create a, a mathematical theory in which these notions of the whole and the part um, have their, their place. And uh, it's only in that concrete mathematical theory that you can come to a determinate uh, solution to the problem of the relationship of the whole and the part. Uh, um, did they cre did they create uh, that? Did they end up creating that theory or not? 
Uh, yes. So, so for for Lotman, these ideas are are prior to the theory, uh, and they underlie the the creation of that theory. So, uh, the mathematician who um, who does the the work of uh, putting together this mathematical theory is uh, sort of realizing or or incarnating, as he puts it, um, realizing the uh, the the dialectic of the the idea. Um, so it, the ideas precede the the mathematical um, theory that uh, they they create, um, right? And and yeah, so some of these notions that he um, he he gives a, a brief list here in the first paragraph. So he talks about the whole and the part, the extrinsic and the intrinsic, uh, um, the notions of existence and essence. Um, we'll see that a little bit later. Uh, and then continuous and discontinuous. So these are all notions that he um, that he analyzed in his uh, primary thesis. Um, uh, and uh, so he identifies these notions at work in a number of different mathematical theories, and uh, he uh, he shows how the the same notions appear within these these different mathematical theories. Uh, and uh, and so there's this um, sort of uh, overarching unity of mathematics beyond um, uh, the specifics of particular mathematical theories. There's the, these overarching notions that unify different domains of mathematics with each other, even if the um, mathematical connection from one to the other is not obvious. I wonder if this could be described in terms of the um, sort of putting into communication of two different terms and disparation, so they can. Yeah, that's that's, a, that's an interesting suggestion. Um, I think I think in in distinction to Simon Don for Lutman, this uh, notion of the does that consists of these contrary notions that that is uh, taking place. So you have uh, these ideas that um, realize themselves in mathematical theories, uh, and and this operation is is all sort of taking place outside of space and time. Um, it's it's a an ideal genesis rather than a, a real one. And in Simon Don, um, the genesis that we um, look at in in the process of individuation is a, a real genesis. It's something that's actually taking place in space and time. Uh, so I think um, it, it's definitely possible to make connections between the two, and, and this is something that Deleuze does. Um, but I, I think the sense of the what, what this term genesis means is different in the two cases. Uh, we were taking in a class uh... Uh, like the difference between our artificial and natural and like uh, synthetic. Uh, but here, uh, is it the close, the definite, the extrinsic and uh, intrinsic? Because I, I was looking up a uh, definition of extrinsic. The closest to artificial is superficial, but it's not really artificial, the definition. It's more like internal, internal and external. Do you think it can be used as an artificial thing, extrinsic, or it's like way too far? Hmm. Um, I think when he's talking about intrinsic and extrinsic, um, so he he talks about. Um, um, I mean, my my uh, familiarity with some of the mathematics behind it is is not sufficient to really explain this properly, but there are some, uh, like when when you analyze a surface in in uh, in mathematics, you can you can analyze it either from the perspective of uh, embedding that surface in a space. Um, so if you have like a two-dimensional sheet of paper, uh, or you know you consider the sheet of paper as a two-dimensional uh, surface, um, you can look at the shape of the surface within a three-dimensional space, and you can see, for example, whether the surface is twisted um, uh, or whether it's flat, uh, or whether there are curves or bumps or whatever on the surface. You can you can analyze it from an extrinsic perspective by looking at it within a three-dimensional space. 
Uh, but what you can also do is look at the surface from an intrinsic perspective. So you, you look at the surface as if you were um, living on that surface. Uh, you, you sort of picture yourself as a, a two-dimensional being that inhabits this surface. Um, and then you can analyze what properties of that surface you can uh, find without having to go outside the surface itself. Uh, so like um, the, the, there's a famous uh, construction called the Möbius strip, um, which anyone who's read Lacan is probably familiar with. Um, it uh, essentially you just take a, a strip of paper and you twist it around uh, once and then you attach the two ends together. And um, uh, the the surface has the property that it has only one side. Um, so if you start, if you take a, a pencil and you start drawing a line down the, uh, the surface, you keep going and you arrive back at the beginning, and both sides of the paper are going to be uh, or are going to have the line on it. Um, uh, but that's. Uh, uh, an extrinsic characterization of the surface, but what you can do actually um, as an intrinsic uh, characterization of the surface is you can um, you can show that uh, uh, if you slide if you have a, a vertical line on the surface and you slide it all the way around the surface, uh, it comes back to its original starting point, but upside down. Um, so it goes around the surface once, and then it it, uh, it arrives back at the starting point upside down. And then if it goes around again, it comes back to its original orientation. Uh, and so um, this inversion, this uh, arriving back at the starting point upside down, is an intrinsic characterization of the surface because it doesn't require you to go outside the surface itself. I found a, a small interesting paragraph um, by Gilbert Ryle. Uh, do you know him? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's. Uh, it's very related to also topology. Uh, do you want me to read it? Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, it says, uh, um, <clears throat> "Competent uh, Ryle uh, anal analogizes uh, philosophy to cartography. Competent uh, speakers of a language. Uh, Ryle believes." Um, are to a philosopher what uh, ordinary villagers are to a map maker. The ordinary villager has a competent grasp of his village and is familiar with its inhabitants and geography. But when asked to interpret a map of that knowledge, the villager ha will have difficulty until he is able to translate uh, his practical knowledge into universal cartographic terms. The villager thinks of the village in personal and practical terms, while the map maker thinks of the village in neutral, public, cartographic terms. Is that related? Yeah, I think that's a similar type of distinction between the intrinsic and the extrinsic. So the, the villager has an intrinsic knowledge of the village and, and the, um, the, the cartography or the, the um, uh, topography of the domain. So they, they know that, um, you know, here's, there's a hill, here there's a forest, here there's a stream, etc. cetera. Um, but um, the map maker looks at the village from an extrinsic perspective. So from outside and like, as if they were, um, floating above the, the village and, and they draw the map that way. Um, so I think it's a similar distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic. Yeah, the, the, so yeah, Leith Mason has posted in the chat that this is similar to the terms from anthropology, the emic and the etic. Um, um, yeah, so the, there's the same type of distinction between um, uh, the sort of internal perspective of a society um, the the emic perspective um, where where you look at um, how the members of the society sort of live their uh, the objects of that society the the institutions and uh, ceremonies and uh, uh, you know everyday practices of that society uh, and then there's the the edic or edic I don't know how you say that um, either way um, the uh, the edic um, uh, approach to analyzing a society which looks at it from outside and uh, tries to analyze its uh, practices from an external perspective. 
And so for, for Lotman, um, it's not about, you know, saying that one is better than the other or uh, more important or more fundamental or anything like that. Uh, it's this, it's this pair of notions that, um, constitutes an idea and, uh, in any given mathematical theory, uh, there's there's always um, some sort of interaction of these two notions uh, that, or mixture, and he is the term he uses. Um, so you um, you find that you can um, in the in the theory of surfaces, for example, there are certain properties of the surface that you can sort of um, identify in either way. You can you can uh, show that a surface has a property using extrinsic methods. Uh, and then you can also show that it, it has the same property using intrinsic methods. So there, there's a sort of um, back and forth from intrinsic to extrinsic. OK, so let's go on to the um, discuss or the uh, presentation itself. Um, so let's read um, a page or so of uh, Cavalles' talk, and then we'll, we'll pause and discuss if someone else would like to read. I can read the report of the session. Uh, Mr. Cavallas. The reflections that I would like to present are situated at a given moment in the development of mathematics, that is to say, at the moment when we are. They contain, because of the very singularity of this moment, two parts, which I have moreover distinguished in the summary that has been communicated to you. The first part contains the results that mathematics itself has given us on the philosophical problem of the, of the essence of mathematical thought, this first part, we only have to translate it to explain it. We may be able to debate the scope of its results, but I believe that this is the indisputable part that I'm proposing. But this indisputable part happens to be negative, and thus I propose, after having briefly summarized it, to introduce some positive reflections that are grafted onto the results obtained, as well as onto the current development of mathematics, as we see it being done before our eyes. On the first part, I will say little. I do not want, in particular, to link it as precisely as I should with the earlier stages of mathematical philosophy, especially in the 19th century. I will only say, in short, that in the mathematics of the 19th century, one was led by the very development of the different branches of mathematics and the need to abandon the intuitive evidence that had previously been resorted to, to emphasize the notion of demonstration. Evidence yielded to demonstrability. Hence, this idea which spread out which spread among just about all mathematicians and which we find in researchers as different as Frege and Dedekind, that mathematics is a part of logic. What in fact guarantees the results is the rigorous nature of the sequences of reasoning by which they have been established. There is therefore at this time an effort to reduce not only all the procedures of mathematicians with the notions to which they appeal, to purely logical procedures and notions, an effort which was helped by the development of set theory and which moreover partly elicited it. This shows how the rapprochement was possible since the notion of set itself seemed the furthest, the farthest from any intuition. And since on the other hand, it could be confused with the notion of class or extension. Still in 1907, Sir Mello, in the opening of his axiomatization of set theory, wrote, set theory is the branch of mathematics to which it is incumbent to study mathematically the fundamental concepts of number, order, and function in their primitive simplicity, and by this to develop the logical bases of arithmetic as a whole and of analysis. We can thereby see how, until 1907, that is to say, after the appearance of the greatest paradoxes, the hope still remained in a set in a theorist of sets like Sir Mello to base mathematics, that is to say, arithmetic and analysis, on a purely logical notion. This hope was disappointed not so much because of the difficulties that set theory encountered at that time through the discovery of antinomies, but because of the effort that mathematicians themselves made to decide whether this hope could be realized or not. That is, through the effort by which they transformed a philosophical conception of mathematics into a technical problem of mathematicians. Indeed, when one wanted to clarify the concept of set and the subsequent theory, one came up against the need to, need to axiomatize this theory. That is to say, 
to identify the fundamental notions and the procedures used. As a result, one found oneself in the presence of technical problems that could be answered precisely. These are works that were accomplished in the school gathered around Russell and that of Hilbert, and of which in France, one of the initiators was with great vigor, Jacques Herbron. His absence for those who knew him, both philosophers and mathematicians is made every day, even today, cruelly felt. Oh, should I keep reading or should we stop there? Um, yeah, we can stop here for now because there's a couple um, points to discuss in, in that part. Um, let me see. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned in the uh, first part, uh, Caveas' presentation is uh, sort of uh, broken in two parts. Like uh, there's the negative part that he presents first and then there's the positive part. Um, so this negative part has to do with showing that certain conceptions of philosophy of mathematics are no longer viable as a result of the development of mathematics itself. Um, um, and so he, he starts with, um, um, there's a, a point here that I, I, I realized, um, just as we started today, that I, I need to explain it a little more in the translation um, because uh, so he, he talks about how in the 19th century um, there was this transition from evidence to demonstrability as the uh, sort of central notion of mathematics. Um, but here, um, uh, the term evidence, I should have uh, put a note to this effect in the translation, but um, evidence here means the, the state of being evident or, or being, uh, being obvious. So um, what Caveas here is, is, is saying is that prior to the 19th century, mathematicians um, sort of built their work around this notion of something being evident. Um, and, and, and so there was, uh, like in Euclid's work, um, the axioms are called common notions. And the idea is that um, these are principles that are immediately obvious. So as soon as you understand the meaning of the words, then you automatically or immediately know that the statement is true. Um, so like one of the axioms is uh, that the whole is greater than, uh, than the part. So if you can show that A is a part of B, then you show that uh, you've shown that B is greater than A. Um, uh, so uh, this notion of evidence is one, or of, of something being evident, is uh, is one that um, was sort of central to to mathematics um, up until the nineteenth century, uh, and then in the nineteenth century, you start to have uh, um, the for example, in uh, geometry, you have um, non-Euclidean geometry appears. Uh, so people start to look at uh, geometrical systems that are not at all obvious or evident. Um, so they they have various strange properties, like the angles uh, contained in a triangle are are greater or less than 180 degrees, um, and. Uh, um, there is, uh, as soon as you start looking at these non-obvious or non-evident mathematical theories, then you you have to rely on the the capacity to demonstrate rather than the capacity for something to be immediately obvious. Uh, and so, in non-Euclidean geometry, for example, you start out with a set of axioms, and then you just see what follows from those axioms, uh, whether it's evident or not, um, and uh, and so this notion of demonstrability starts to become more central to mathematical thought, uh, as opposed to the the notion of uh, of uh, evidence. Uh, and and for Cavayas, or or what what Cavayas is arguing here is that um, this notion of um, uh, demonstrability is uh, one of the motivations that leads to the mathematical philosophy of logicism, which tries to 
uh, reduce mathematical operations and concepts to logical ones. Um, and, uh, and so this, uh, it's because mathematicians are increasingly oriented towards, uh, towards demonstrations that they, um, they find the need, the need or the, um, they feel like this is something that is important to reduce mathematical concepts to logical ones. Uh, and then he points to um, uh, Cermelo in 1907. Um, so this is a, another instance where um, something non-evident uh, uh, is, is justified on the basis of demonstrability. So Cermelo, um, he gives a, a proof, um, I think it was earlier 1907 or maybe 1906, he gives a proof of the well orderability of uh, of any set, so he, he proves that um, any set can be ordered such that it has a least element. Um, uh, and um, uh, sorry, such that uh, every subset of that set has a least element. Um, and and so uh, this proof uh, receives a lot of criticism. Uh, there's a lot of people that argue that it is not a, a real proof. Uh, and so to try to justify his uh, argument, he comes up with this axiomatization. So he, he sets out a set of axioms for set theory, which uh, formed the basis of the sort of uh, standard set theory of today, which is known as ZFC for Semelo, Frankel, uh, and Choice. Uh, and, and that um, the C for Choice is the one that ends up being the most controversial. Um, so there's a this axiom of choice um, that uh, a lot of mathematicians find objectionable. They think it's not uh, um, something that you can presuppose or um, uh, something that uh, is is a valid principle. Uh, but then what uh, what comes about is that um, um, a couple. Uh, some of the people who had objected to this axiom of choice that Tomelo had pr uh, proposed, uh, other people are able to show that they actually presuppose in their work um, principles that are equivalent to the axiom of choice. So they're um, they're objecting to this principle, but then at the same time they're using uh, equivalent principles in their reasoning without realizing it. Um, so all this is to say that. Um, uh, in in this uh, proposal in in 1907 of this axiomatization of set theory, um, the uh, Tsumelo is um, using this notion of demonstrability uh, as a as a basis for um, justifying his his proof, uh, and then he uh, uh, in this passage quoted by by Cavalles here he he suggests um, that. Set theory uh, is uh, sort of the logical basis of uh, of mathematics, um, and and so uh, there's still in 1907 um, there's still this um, hope or this uh, idea that mathematical concepts should be reducible to um, to logical ones, uh, and then set theory is thought of as being uh, a logical theory. Uh, you said. Um... Uh, ev evidence and another word uh, that goes with it, um, but I didn't hear you because you c cut off. Your 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 voice disappeared. Oh, um, was it the word demonstrability? Is that the one you're thinking of? No, it was another word that you oh. said with evidence. Um, maybe obviousness or the state of being evident. No, it's okay. It's all right. It's not that important. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure which word you're you're thinking of. Um, but yeah, so evidence um, here means the property of being evident. It doesn't mean like uh, when you talk about like uh, in a criminal case and and the prosecutor presents evidence of the of the um, accused being guilty or something lo along those lines. Um, right. And let's see. Well, what else was there? 
Right. And so he, he mentioned here the um, antinomies of set theory. Um, and so what, what this refers to is um, in the sort of last third of the 19th century. Um, uh, so Cantor um, develops this notion of set theory uh, and the, the concept of a set. Um, and he develops it uh, in what's sometimes called a, a naive way. So he doesn't have an axiomatization of set theory. He, he just starts from a, um, a, a sort of intuitive understanding of what a, a set means or um, the set of objects that fall under a certain concept, for example. Um, and um, there, there are certain paradoxes that arise towards the end of the 19th century uh, and beginning of the 20th century. And the, the most famous one is the Russell paradox, which, um, which um, uh, the short version, well, the, there's a, a sort of popular version that, that Russell um, put together as well. And with, so it's the, the barber. Yeah, exactly. So the barber uh, of this regiment um, shaves every man who doesn't shave himself. Um, and, and so then the question arises, uh, whether the barber shaves himself. And so if, uh, if he does, um, then that means that he is a man who shaves himself and therefore he, that means he doesn't shave himself. So, um, uh, so if, if he does shave himself, then he doesn't shave himself. Um, but then if you assume that he doesn't shave himself, then he's one of the men that the barber shaves. So that means he does shave himself. Uh, so either whether, whether you assume that he does shave himself or you assume that he doesn't shave himself, you end up in a contradiction. Uh, and so the more formal version of this is, um, if you, uh, if you define a set, uh, of all, um, of all the sets that don't include themselves, um, so, uh, a set, uh, such that it is not a member of itself. Um, then it, you you can ask the question whether that set is itself a member of itself. Uh, and so if it is a member of itself, then it has the property of not being a member of itself and therefore it's not a member of itself. Um, and then uh, if, if it's not a member of itself, then it has the defining property uh, of that set. So it, it, is, it is a member of itself. So again, either, either assumption that you make, you end up in a contradiction. Um, and so these uh, paradoxes like this uh, lead to the idea that um, set theory is a, a sort of dangerous um, field of mathematics, that uh, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's something that's not certain uh, because you never know when one of these contradictions is going to appear. Um, um, <laughs> Yeah, card elimination. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, it's because of these antinomies that um, the the idea that you need to be much more careful when when doing set theory uh, starts to become prominent in the early or sorry early twentieth century, um, and uh, so Russell and and. Uh, um, Hilbert were, were some of the people who uh, worked on this and uh, the axiomatization that um, Sir Melo started working on uh, ended up becoming the, the sort of um, standard framework for mathematics in the sort of uh, mid 20th century onwards. Uh, okay, so let's go on to the next um, page or so of this uh, passage, uh, if someone else would like to read. Thank you. The results I indicated in my summary as we were dealing with a problem that could be solved in a mathematical way, two fundamental conceptions of mathematics were rejected. One, the conception that I quoted at the beginning, this famous hope of reducing mathematics to logic, logicism is eliminated. I do not insist on the reasons, I note them in my summary, and I also permit myself to refer for details to my book, Méthode Axiomatique et Formalisme. By trying to formalize mathematics in its entirety, one has come to the conclusion that the procedures used cannot all be reasonably called logical. 
I believe that it would be imprudent to engage here in the debate on the very essence of logical thinking, as it would lead us too far away. I can at least indicate that if we formalize arithmetic, we must involve the principle of complete induction, which can hardly be reduced to a system of logical notions. Second, it is impossible to insert all mathematics into a single formal system. This is the result given by a theorem that appears in the article published by Gödel in 1931. Another possible conception remains, the famous and old conception of the hypothetico-deductive system. This is no longer a single formal system, but an assembly of formal systems that are arbitrarily constructed and can be juxtaposed and constitute the whole of mathematics. This hypothetico-deductive conception is also made impossible by another theorem published by Gödel in the same article. Quote, the non-contradiction of a mathematical formal system containing the theory of numbers can be proved only by mathematical means not representable in this system, unquote. It is therefore absurd to define mathematics as a set of hypothetico-deductive systems, since to characterize as deductive systems these formal systems, one must already use mathematics. I remind the audience in particular that if we consider the formal system that represents the theory of numbers, we have a characterization of this system as a deductive system. To characterize a system as a deductive system is to show that we cannot demonstrate everything in it. It is to demonstrate its non-contradiction. We now have a proof due to Gensen, which employs transfinite induction, that is, a mathematical procedure outside of number theory. I indicated that the most precise conception of the hypothetico-deductive representation was due to von Neumann. The idea of Hilbert's school was this. Obviously, we need mathematical notions to characterize a formal system, but these notions are very elementary. In the hypothetico-deductive system of Hilbert's axioms, for Euclidean geometry, the notions are very simple. Finite integer, putting into correspondence. This is illusory because the non-contradiction of Hilbert's axioms in Euclidean geometry was only demonstrable by the construction of a system borrowed from number theory. And for this construction in turn, we are obliged to appeal to that transfinite induction. So those are the results. The philosopher may now wonder in the presence as well as, uh, as, well as of the current development of mathematics, what positive conclusions he can state. Right, so there's a, a few sort of technical points in that passage that are worth um, stopping on. Um, so, um, he, he talks about um, Gödel's two, two theorems, um, or two, the two uh, incompleteness theorems. So the first one, um, uh, and uh, there's a, a statement of this um, earlier in the chat that, that Angus has posted, but the first one um, effectively says that um, in any system, uh, uh, any system that's powerful enough to do arithmetic, so that um, uh, includes the the Peano axioms. Um, uh, these are uh, a famous axiomatization of of arithmetic from the late nineteenth century. Um, so, in any system that's powerful enough to do arithmetic, you there are certain statements that can neither be proven nor disproven in that system. Um, and so, what that means is that there's a, a incompleteness in the sense that if you start with the set of axioms, you can't prove either that uh, that the uh, a certain statement is true or or prove that it's false. So it it's uh, that statement is independent of the axioms. Um, and so this first incompleteness proof um, uh, incompleteness theorem, um, Kavayas takes it to show that uh, logicism is is not um, not uh, a possible um, um, approach to to mathematics, or it's not a viable philosophy of mathematics anymore. Um, and so, if logicism would try to reduce mathematics to um, a, a single uh, formal system, then it would not be. Uh, uh, it would that would mean it would be inconsistent. So as long as you have a formal uh, a formal system that's consistent, it's not possible to include all of mathematics. Um, and then the second theorem uh, is is the one that he takes to be um, to be uh, uh, a 
an argument against the, this hypothetical deductive conception that I talked about earlier. Um, and so the second incompleteness theorem says that if you have a consistent formal system, then it's not possible to prove within that consistent within that system that that the system is consistent. So um, the the sentence stating that the formal system is consistent is itself not provable within that system. Um, and so what this means is that um, uh, when you do, um, when you prove the consistency of a formal system, you have to appeal to uh, uh, a, a stronger uh, formal system to prove that consistency. So if you want to prove the consistency of arithmetic, you have to appeal to uh, a formal system that is um, uh, stronger than uh, arithmetic that you are proving the consistency of. Uh, and there's some subtleties around that that I'm sort of skipping over, but that's sort of the uh, brief version of the of the argument. Um, and um, he he also talks about Gensen's proof of uh, the non-consistency of arithmetic. Uh, sorry, of the consistency of arithmetic, the non-contradiction of arithmetic. Um, and this proof um, uses the principle um, uses the principle of transfinite induction. Um, so this uh, transfinite induction is is uh, similar to the principle of, of mathematical induction that I described earlier, um, except that it extends into infinite um, infinite numbers. Uh, so you, uh, if you want to show that um, a certain property holds in general, like you want to say that um, every x has property p, then you can show that it applies to um, to the empty set uh, and then uh, um, or whatever your base case is, you, you start from a particular base case uh, or it could be the number zero, for example. Um, you show that it applies to that base case and then you show that it applies to the successor in some sort of successor operation. Uh, as soon as it applies to um, one stage, it applies to the next stage in this operation. Uh, and then you also show that it applies to the limit case. So um, the the limit is a maybe a little bit difficult concept to explain in in informal terms, but the idea is that um, uh, if you Take all the if you take the natural numbers, you know one, two, three, etc. Uh, the limit of that series is what comes after all those numbers, or the collection of all the numbers. So, um, in in uh, in mathematics, this is written with the letter omega. Uh, so the the limit of the series of natural numbers is the the set of all the natural numbers. Um, it, it contains all the natural numbers, so it's greater than any given natural number, no matter how big it might be. Um, and in mathematical induction, you, you show that it, uh, some property holds of the base case, you show that it applies to the successor, uh, and then you show that it applies at limits. Uh, and then it, if you've shown those three cases, then that means that you've shown that this property holds universally. Uh, so that's, that's what transfinite induction is. Um, uh, okay. You said um, you said if we can't uh, prove a system uh, because of the contradiction, we have to uh, refer to another system that is bigger than it. Uh, like, uh, is it always uh, supposed to be bigger than it, or can it be just like different system from it? Um, so, bigger is not quite the right term, but stronger is um, probably a, a better term. So. Um, if you want to prove that arithmetic is consistent, for example, you have to use um, the uh, this principle of transfinite induction. So you have to already appeal to um, uh, infinite numbers and some especially big infinite numbers, actually, a number called epsilon zero. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so you have to um, you have to use these uh, tools that are actually more powerful than the ones you're trying to um, 
uh, prove the non-contradiction of. And so what, what this means for this formalism uh, approach to mathematics that, that Hilbert had set out. Um, so Hilbert wanted to um, sort of uh, uh, show that these uh, more uh, questionable or, or less certain areas of mathematics could be reduced to um, operations in the uh, in the more certain um, areas of mathematics, like arithmetic, um, and so you would essentially you would show that um, uh, set theory or analysis or other areas are non-contradictory by reducing them to um, less powerful um, tools like uh, arithmetic. But um, what this result of Gödel shows is that you actually can't do that. You have to you have to use more powerful tools to show that the less powerful tools are non-contradictory. All right, so they're more powerful, not different tools. Like you can't bring a totally different system to, to um, fix, uh, to prove something. You have to use something more powerful. Yeah, so it can't be just any other system. It has to be one that that has um, more deductive power. Um, so meaning that um, you can prove more things in that system. So there there are certain things in um, system A that you can't prove in system B, uh, and that means system B is more powerful than system A. But yeah, so the the sort of big picture is that um, this enterprise of trying to um, trying to use the most basic set of tools, the, the least powerful tools, um, to show the, the consistency of the more powerful tools, uh, that enterprise is, is not viable anymore. Um, we have learned as a result of, of Gödel and Gensen's work that you have to actually use more powerful tools to show that the, the less powerful ones are, are consistent. So it's it's a, a sort of a, a paradoxical result. It's as if you had to use a computer to to be able to use a hammer or something like that. Uh, uh, if, if you want to take a, an analogy from uh, um, a non mathematical domain. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next bit. Um, let's see how are the time. Um, yeah, we probably will only get through the Cavalier part today, um, but that's fine. Um, so I can read the next bit. Um, Right, so we're on page five. <clears throat> I would like to state straight away that I do not purport to give these conclusions a definitive form. It is a very difficult task on which for the time being I am presenting only reflections, which I submit to you, reflections which are still somewhat imbued with the effort of the work. And I now indicate only those points on which I believe I have reached maximum certainty. First point, the idea of defining mathematics seems to me to be rejected both because of the, the results I have just mentioned and as a result of the very reflection on the work of the mathematician. Mathematics constitutes a becoming, that is to say, a reality irreducible to something other than itself. What can the endeavor defining mathematics mean? It is either to say that mathematics is this, which is not mathematical, and then it is absurd, or to list the procedures used by mathematicians. I leave aside the first solution, even though it has had and still has supporters. That leaves the second. I do not believe that any mathematician would accept a definitive and exhaustive list of the procedures he uses. We can list them at some point, but it is absurd to say this only is mathematical and outside of the use, these, sorry, outside the use of these procedures, one will no longer do mathematics. I believe that I am here in agreement on the one hand with the results obtained, such as, for example, the necessarily unsaturated character of any mathematical theory which proves the requirement for the intervention of new rules of reasoning each time a theory develops. And on the other hand, with the conception of mathematics as it is found in intuitionism, and Heiting, for example, wrote recently that mathematics constitutes an organic system in full development, to which it is inadmissible to want to assign boundaries. Mathematics is a becoming. All we can do is try to understand its history, that is to say, to situate mathematics among other intellectual activities, to find certain characteristics of this becoming. I will mention two of them. One, this becoming is autonomous. That is to say, it is impossible to place oneself outside it. Uh, sorry, if it is impossible to place oneself outside it, one can, by studying the historical contingent development of mathematics as it presents itself to us, see necessities under the sequence of notions and procedures. 
Here, of course, the word necessity cannot be specified in any other way. One notes problems and one sees that these problems required the appearance of a new concept. That is all that can be done, and it is certain that this use of the word require is too easy for us, since we are on the other side, we see the successes. We can, however, say that the concepts that have emerged have really provided a solution to problems that did in fact arise. I believe that it is possible, under the picturesque contingency of the sequence of theories, to engage in this work. I tried, for my part, to do it for the theory of sets. I do not claim to have succeeded, but precisely in the development of this theory, which would, however, seem to be the very example of a theory of genius, made by means of radically unpredictable inventions, it seemed to me that I saw an internal necessity. It was certain problems of analysis that gave rise to the essential notions, and gave rise to certain procedures already spotted by Bolzano or Le Jeune de Riflet, and which became the fundamental procedures perfected by Pantor. Autonomy, therefore, necessity. Two, this becoming develops as a true becoming, that is to say, it is unpredictable. It may not be unpredictable for the intuitions of the active mathematician who guesses where one must search, but it is unpredictable originally in an authentic way. This is what we could call the fundamental dialectic of mathematics. If the new notions appear as made necessary by the problem posed, this very novelty is really a complete novelty. That is to say, we cannot, by a simple analysis of the notions already used, find within them the new notions, the generalizations, for example, which have given rise to new procedures. This novelty, I will characterize it by the second point of my conclusion, namely that the activity of mathematics is an experimental activity. Uh, actually, I'll stop here. Um, Right. Um, yeah, so a question from Angus in the chat. So dialectics for Cavayas means a reconciliation of opposites. Um, I think reconciliation might be the wrong word um, or not quite the right word. Um, it's a sort of um, um, holding together of opposites is how I would put it. It's, um, it, so this necessity and this contingency are, are two sides of mathematical experience uh, that we have to hold on to at the same time, uh, even though they seem to be contradictory to each other. Um, so it's, it's not that we sort of reconcile them in the sense that we come to some sort of uh, synthesis that includes both of them. Uh, it's that we have to hold on to both at the same time. Uh, I think that's, that's how he understands dialectics. Um, Right, so here we get to the, the positive portion of uh, Cavallese's presentation. So here he's presenting his actual um, reflections on mathematical activity um, rather than just opposing the conceptions that other people have presented. Um, and uh, so he starts with um, this autonomy. Um, so the idea here is that um, uh, there's a kind of necessity that we see um, in retroactive studies of the history of mathematics. So as soon as, uh, as a problem has been solved, we can see the necessity of that solution um, retroactively. So we can see, yes, this problem uh, required a solution along these lines. Um, and uh, so this autonomy um, is is essentially synonymous with necessity um, that we we find this necessity in mathematics. Uh, but then at the same time we have this um, unpredictability or this contingency to mathematics. Um, so there's a, a real novelty in the sense that um, there's no way to predict what the solution of a problem will be just from uh, some sort of analysis of the problem itself. So that you have to uh, create new concepts and new techniques and so on. Um, and uh, it's because of this novelty um, that it's not possible to uh, produce uh, some sort of definitive list and say these 10 procedures or 100 or whatever procedures are what makes up mathematics and then uh, anything as aside from these uh, would not be mathematical. 
Um, one technical point that um, I should explain here is uh, about intuitionism, which Cavayas uh, um, uh, refers to here. So intuitionism was another philosophy, or, or I, guess, I should say is another um, philosophy of mathematics, uh, which appeared in the early, 19th cent uh, early 20th century. Um, uh, it had to do with... Um, so there's this idea of mathematical intuition, um, which we find already in, in Plato, but um, uh, is, is developed in uh, the early 20th century. So there's this idea that um, mathematical activity has to do with um, uh, this sort of uh, immediate experience of um, uh, uh, of mathematical objects. So, so we have the uh, sort of immediate givenness to us of mathematical objects. Um, and we, um, in this uh, immediate givenness, we, um, we have to, we have to sort of hold on to that immediate givenness. And if you uh, um, allow for something that is not immediately given uh, to appear within your mathematics, then you're um, opening yourself up to uh, the possibility of uh, a contradiction appearing in your work. Uh, and so what this means more concretely is that uh, intuitionists object to certain procedures of uh, mathematical proof that um, they call non-constructive proofs. So you can, uh, for example, in some cases, you can prove that a certain number exists uh, you can say that if if this number didn't exist, then uh, a contradiction would appear. Uh, but you your proof doesn't actually give you the number; it just says this number exists. Uh, so that 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 would be a non-constructive proof. It's a, a proof that doesn't actually construct the the number that you're um, looking for. And intuitionists object to that method of proof. Um, they they uh, hold that. Um, what all you've proven is the absurdity of the uh, of holding that uh, the number doesn't exist, but you haven't actually proven that the, the existence of the number until you can actually construct the number. You can say the number is you know four thousand two hundred and twenty seven or whatever. Um, uh, and so, what what results from this uh, approach to mathematical proof is that you have to basically reconstruct. Uh, mathematics, um, you have to uh, develop a whole new system of mathematics that doesn't rely on arguments from uh, from contradiction, uh, like like the one I, I uh, alluded to. Um, so you can't prove something exists unless you actually construct uh, uh, an instance of it. Um, and um, so yeah, th this this is a uh, a minority position within mathematics. Um, there, there are very few mathematicians who actually um, consider themselves intuitionists and, and uh, uh, hold that intuitionistic mathematics is the only valid form. Um, but uh, what, uh, what has happened essentially is that intuitionistic mathematics has become a, a field of mathematical study uh, in its own right. So there's intuitionistic logic, and you can use intuitionistic logic as a uh, as a something to study. You, you can you can study intuitionistic logic and see what you can prove using this system and so on. Uh, and then you can uh, you can have systems of constructive um, analysis or uh, various other other fields. Um, uh, right. Thanks. Yeah. So that's uh, uh, a video on constructive mathematics. Um, 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 so it was yeah, the, the same, same time uh, the mathematic wave or uh, the the movement that started between like Russell and uh, the other mathematicians that were also like involved in linguistics uh, in the same time, right? Oh, there were different people, like different movements. All yeah. Same so yeah, so Russell um, was a, a logicist, so he, he wanted to reduce mathematical operations to logic. Um, 
intuitionism uh, is is different in the sense that it um, it requires a, a revision of mathematics and of logic. So you have to um, you have to modify the existing mathematics. Whereas what Russell wanted to do was to um, account for the existing mathematics in logical terms. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next bit. Uh, where did I stop? Um, uh, right, so we can start from this novelty, uh, if someone else would like to read. Uh, no volunteers. I can go again. This novelty, I will characterize it by the second point of my conclusion, namely that the activity of mathematicians is an experimental activity. By experiment, experience, I mean a system of gestures governed by a rule and subject to conditions independent of these gestures. I recognize the vagueness of such a definition, and I believe that it is impossible to overcome it entirely without taking actual examples. By this, I mean that each mathematical procedure is defined in relation to a previous mathematical situation on which it depends in part, in relation to which it also maintains such an independence that the result of this gesture must be observed in its being carried out. That, I think, is where we can define mathematical experiment. Does this mean that the experiment has anything to do with what is actually called that? I believe that it is better to reserve it for the very word experiment. In particular, the physical experiment seems to me a complex of many heterogeneous elements on which I would not like to insist today this would take us too far away, but which in particular does not have that character that gestures are performed in accordance with a rule, nor that on the other hand, the result has a meaning in the system itself, which is the case with the mathematical experiment. That is to say, the mathematical situation being given, the gesture performed gives us a result, which by the very fact that it appears, takes its place in a mathematical system extending the previous system, containing it as a special case. How can these experiments be carried out? I tried to do this in my book on the axiomatic method in a very incomplete way, but which I hope to clarify later. I have indicated some of the procedures used by mathematicians. This is, of course, a rough description because at every moment there are certain procedures that are in a mathematical atmosphere, a state of mathematics at a given moment that may not be transportable. I have, however, indicated some of these procedures, drawing inspiration from both Hilbert's analyses and from those of Dedekind in his speech to Gauss in 1857, which was approved by Gauss and recently published by Ms. Noether in 1931. I call the first procedure in general, uh, I call the first procedure in general, thematization, that is to say that the gestures performed on a model or domain of individuals can in turn be considered as individuals on which the mathematician will work by considering them as a new domain. For example, topology of topological transformations, and there are many other examples. This procedure allows the superposition of mathematical reflections, and it also has the interest of showing us that the bond between the concrete activity of the mathematician from the first moments of its development, to put two symmetrical objects next to each other, to make them change places, and the most abstract operations does not cease, because each time the bond is in fact that of systems because each time the bond is in the fact that the system of objects considered is a system of operations, which themselves are operations on other operations that ultimately are found on concrete objects. Second procedure named by Hilbert, idealization or adjunction of ideal elements. It simply consists in requiring that an operation, which was accidentally limited by certain circumstances extrinsic to the very accomplishments of this operation, be freed from this extrinsic limitation, and this is done by positing of a system of objects that no longer coincides with the objects of intuition. This is how, for example, the various generalizations of the notion of number have been made. Right, so here we have um, these, um, this, well, maybe the first point is the, the characterization of mathematics as an exper experiment or experience. Um, and he gives an explanation of what he means by that, but the explanation itself is kind of obscure, I think. Um, but it has, so it has to do with um, um, a system of gestures governed by a rule and subject to conditions independent of these gestures. Um, so the idea here, is, as we see a little bit later, um, has to do with the way that um, 
mathematical operations can be brought back to these um, sort of uh, elementary operations, um, like putting two objects next to each other or putting two sets of objects one by one next to each other. Um, uh, so these these sort of operations are the the sort of fundamental um, um, principles or, or not principles I should say but the fundamental operations on which mathematics is based. Um, but at each step, you have to um, uh, introduce new principles or, or new operations for this whole thing to work. Um, so he he gives um, examples of the procedures that that mathematicians use. So we have thematization and idealization. Um, so thematization means that you um, you have some sort of some operation which works with a, a set of objects of some kind. Um, it, so in the most basic case, it would be concrete objects. Um, so, you know, apples or stones or whatever. Um, and uh, then at a, a higher level of abstraction, you treat those operations themselves as objects of a further operation. Um, so you can think about how um, numbers as uh, as mathematical objects are um, abstract abstractions from these operations of putting groups of objects in in correspondence with each other. Um, so instead of um, always thinking in terms of you know groups of stones or or apples, you instead think about a number which is a, an abstraction from this operation, uh, and then you take those numbers themselves as objects and then you do operations on them like addition, subtraction, et cetera. Uh, and then at a more uh, advanced level, you can take addition and subtraction as objects and do operations on addition and subtraction. Uh, and, and so you can keep ascending this hierarchy of, of levels of abstraction. Uh, and then uh, idealization is the, the second principle um, or a second procedure um, where um, so what what he is referring to here or the the uh, example that he has in mind is the the generalizations of the notion of number so uh, the basic notion of number is uh, the natural numbers one two three etc um, and these these uh, uh, numbers have the property that um, the operations that we perform on numbers are not closed. So uh, you, for any pair of numbers, you can add the two numbers and you get another number. Um, but if you subtract one number from another, you don't necessarily get a natural number. So if you, if you have the number three and you try to subtract the number five from it, you get something that is not a natural number anymore. Um, uh, and um, so what this generalization of the notion of number means is that you, um, you posit the existence or you extend the system of numbers to include negative numbers. Uh, and then now your system is closed under addition and subtraction. So any uh, pair of numbers in your system, uh, you can add them together and you get another number in the system or you can subtract them from each other uh, or you can subtract one from the other and you still get a number in the system. Uh, so these are the integers, and then you can extend to real numbers and complex numbers. Um, right, yeah, so these are uh, rings um, in, uh, in algebraic terms. Um, um, so each, each step of this operation uh, is, is um, you, you find that um, a certain operation is uh, limited in its domain. It can only apply to certain objects in your system. Uh, and then you um, extend your system so that it has enough objects to uh, perform the operation for all of the, uh, all of the objects. So you're not, um, so the domain would not be limited anymore. Uh, so this is um, this uh, adjunction of ideal elements. Uh, so you, you extend your system so that you can perform the operation without limitation. Um, okay, let's see. How much time do we have left? Um, we can go for another maybe 10 minutes. Um, 
let's see if we can try to finish the um, Kaveya's portion. Um, so I can read the next bit. Uh, okay. What will be the consequence for the very notion of mathematical object? I have tried to indicate this in a way that is perhaps unsatisfactory, I admit. It does not completely satisfy me myself, but it is an approximation. The mathematical object is thus, in my opinion, always correlative of gestures actually performed by the mathematician in a given situation. Does this mean that this object has a particular mode of existence? There would be, for example, ideal objects existing in themselves. In the strictly mathematical discussions that took place between supporters of the Vienna School and Hilbert's School, the question arose as to whether there was, it was called Platonism, I think the expression does not correspond very well to the matter, but no matter what the word, a region of ideal objects to which mathematics could refer. This is what, in, in an article that appeared this summer, Gensen calls mathematization in itself. I believe that from this point of view, I can go further than Gensen, who tries to reconcile mathematics in itself with the constructionist requirement of intuitionism. I believe that a conception of systems of mathematical objects existing in themselves is in no way necessary to guarantee mathematical reasoning. For example, when it comes to, to the continuous, this conception of mathematical objects must be rejected for a fairly simple reason, namely that it is totally useless, both for the very development of mathematics and for an intelligence of this development. Indeed, if it corresponded to something specific, this would mean that if these objects to which the mathematician refers are not graspable in any intuition, at least their properties, their simultaneous presence, are required at some point in the mathematician's reasoning. Not only does this not happen, but also if we want to clarify what it means, we come up against difficulties that force us to reject this conception. I am referring here to Skolem's paradox. I do not want to explain this paradox, especially since in order to explain it precisely, we would have to use a formalization. Roughly, it means this. If we have a model which we assume satisfies a system of axioms, it is always possible to construct a countable model satisfying that same system of axioms. In particular, one can satisfy the system of axioms of set theory with a countable model. This paradox on which Skolan himself and many others, including this summer Gensen, have thought long and hard, amounts to saying this, that an exhaustive characterization of a model satisfying a system of axioms is impossible. If we assume the posed axioms, that is, the enumeration of the properties we need for the objects, we cannot require that these axioms at the same time generate the objects. We are obliged to assume an existence of a domain of objects, and then from the properties of these objects in this domain, we can deduce other properties. What we cannot say is that our domain of objects can be characterized in a uniform way by our system of axioms. This has the interest not only of eliminating this idealistic conception, so to speak, of the existence of mathematical objects, but also to mark the intimate solidarity by which the moments of mathematical development are bound. There is no starting from scratch. One can historically see mathematics appear in the displacement group of elementary geometry, but if we want to specify what we mean by this, either by the activity of numeration, where is already involved what Poincaré called the intuition of the pure number, or the beginning of elementary geometry, we are obliged in reality to develop all mathematics. We may well stop arbitrarily and say, we are satisfied with this stage, but if we are faithful to the very need, exigence, that govern the birth of these notions and their development, then we will have to raise the problems that arise, for example, from the refusal to stop in circumstances that are external to the problem posed, and then new notions will appear, and not only mathematics up to the present day, but the needs of development, the unsolved problems that bring about their current transformations will be generated. In conclusion, I would therefore say that the very notion of the existence of mathematical objects is of interest to us philosophers because it raises the problem of the very notion of the existence of objects of thought. What is it for an object to exist? Here we find ourselves in the presence of the fact that the archetype of certain rigorous knowledge, which is precisely mathematical knowledge, prevents us from posing objects as existing independently of the system accomplished on these objects, and even independently of a necessary sequence starting from the very beginning of human activity. So we can never posit them in themselves, nor say exactly, here is the world, a world that we would describe. Each time we are forced to say, these are correlates of an activity. All we can think in them is the rules of mathematical reasoning that are required by the problems that arise. And there is even an overflow, a need of surpassing that is found in the unsolved problems, which forces us to posit other objects again, or to transform the definition of the objects originally posited. These are the thoughts I wanted to present. 
and do not hide their incomplete, insufficient character, which is even obvious to me. But I believe that the state of mathematics currently makes at least their essentials necessary. Um, we won't have time to go into some of the technical um, ideas here. Uh, so I think maybe we can save that for next time. So we can talk about the school limb paradox, what exactly that means next time, uh, and then uh, go on to the, the Lopman part of the communication. Um, but I think um, we can also talk before before we get to the school limb paradox, we can talk about um, uh, this idea of how there's no starting from scratch um, or there's no there's no way to um, um, define mathematical objects purely through um, a system of of axioms. Uh, so I think this is um, one of the the key ideas here is that um, our our thinking always sort of comes after the objects that we're that we're thinking about. But um, at the same time, we we have to we we only ever um, have knowledge of these objects uh, through um, a certain formal system. So it's only in mathematics that we have knowledge of mathematical objects. But we can never um, we can never regard these mathematical objects as being created by the axioms or or by the formal system. Um, so yeah, so the, we'll we'll talk about that a little bit more next time because we're pretty much out of time. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, we, we'll stop here for today and uh, we'll discuss the last bit of the Cavalles piece uh, of the of the presentation and then we'll go on to the Lutman part. Okay, so um, thank you everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you have any um, questions or there's parts of the um, text that seem obscure or anything like that, that that's what I'm hoping to get out of these discussions is uh, what are the difficult points and the, the points of the text that need um, more discussion. Um, so yeah, feel free to uh, post them in the, in the chat over the week or, or save them for next time. Thanks, Don. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Don. Stimulating as always. Thanks. All right, bye.